together. This was just amazing to me. It's like, the, you know, a light bulb went on. And, and, um, and yes, yes. The, lang the, the language is very, very tonal. Uh, um, the outside, the outsider is so evident and, um, it, it was just a fascinating, fascinating story, and um, I really liked it. Yeah, Evie, and then Brenda. Yeah, I, I love the story, but I, I love the concept of the story. I had difficulty following her writing, and it might be the tonal kind of a thing, because I had a flashback to when I was a very little girl that started to read, reading books that were about the Eskimos or the Indians. I just had a hard time reading that. But um, to relate to what you just said, with Vanessa, about the Hebrew, back in the days, my Hebrew was, was quite good. My conversation was quite good. However, I could not understand an Israeli-speaking Hebrew, but I could understand an American-speaking Hebrew. So I think it's that tonal thing. And I had the same thing. I had started out as a French major, and I had to give it up because also the tonal whatever, which some of that is similar to Hebrew as well. So as much as I love languages and, and think I'm you know, fairly decent, um, trying at least, but the tone, even in reading the tone of this, a little bit threw me off. But I love the concept. And I mean, I happen to like cultures and similarities and differences. And just re being reminded of doing like the hoa and something like that was just wonderful. <laughs> um, Brenda and then Judith. OK, what I'm going to say is, is is entirely different, but it's also a similarity that that um, the Jews share with the Native Americans, and that is um, the the way Native Americans were slaughtered early on. You could really compare that in a way to the Holocaust, because um, the white people, what they did to them was just unbelievable. I read a book called There, There, and unfortunately I don't have the author's name anymore. And the book is fiction, but at, before the fiction starts, there are some actual situations that happen and it's enough to make your hair stand up on it. That's all I can. Yeah, I, I think what happened to them was terrible. I am very um, reticent to uh, compare anything to the Holocaust, the genocide and millions and millions of people. But what, um, you know, what we did as Americans um, to the native population was absolutely terrible and, um, you know, I think now Biden has just put the first um, Native American into a cabinet position, not into um, interior. Interior, thank you. <laughs> An important, important one. I'm um, Judith. Go ahead. Yeah, the point that I was going to make was that I felt that this was really. Uh, I love the comparisons, which were unique, but one in particular, where on page um, 188, where she describes that her tribe. Uh, wasn't like the Navajo in some ways. And we have one God, but we never picture that God. We never make a picture. Um, I, and I'll tell you an interest, and, and that our, our most important thing is our book and it referring to the Torah. And I, I loved that. And I'll tell you an interesting story. Um, when I worked, I was a photo and text permissions <laughs> researcher. And um, I once submitted a picture of a, a portrait, a, you know, an artist rendering of Mohammed for a book on Saudi Arabia. And the publisher, uh, Children's Press and ultimately Scholastic, um, got sued. And, and a, um, a law, besides the lawsuit, there were death threats against me and against the publisher because you're not allowed to depict Mohammed. And I, I, at the time, I found it fascinating. I didn't know that to be the case because there happened to have been a portrait that someone had made. But we never make a picture of God. And we do respect the Torah. So uh, I, I loved that. I, I felt it was very special and, and, very, and very Jewish. So uh, to me, it was a significant moment, to, very poignant to point out in this particular story. Um, why do you think she jumped at the chance, this is on page 178, I jumped at the chance to learn some Nav Navajo. 
would be a wonderful tongue to lapse into at school. <laughs> I, I mean, you know, I'm very family, bored. <laughs> yeah, my family speaks Hebrew and occasionally, um, like especially um, Arthur and I, I'll say like, how much should we leave for the tip in Hebrew or, you know, things that just between the two of us, but, you know, lapsing into it, I don't know. Um, and why does she expect her coworkers to feel tribal kinship with her as a Jew? I uh, think Judy Biederman. I think she's trying very hard to create a friendship with these girls. And that's about the only way she can do it. And otherwise, it sounds like she's pretty much on her own. And I thought that the difference between where she is at the moment and where she is going from this desert waitressing thing, get herself to college, that's the journey. And a lot of people get lost along the way. And certainly, certainly a lot, a lot of people have. So that. I um, yeah. um, Andy. Um, I, I had a little trouble with her uh, reasons for going and why she was there. And did she feel, um, you know, using them for her own benefit, kind of like judging them, looking at them, trying to be one of them. But underneath, I just like, why was this girl going? You know, she was going to become fluent in Navajo. What was the. You know, sure. for self promoting kind of, um, and then she could leave and go back. And I don't know, it was just one of those kind of cultural dissonance. I think she found some things she might not have thought she would find in the connection, yeah. but it had a little bit of like, you know, she's looking at them from askance. Yeah. Uh, Lynn Salad. Um, I agree with Andy. Uh, I, I was not enamored with this story. I, I had the same feeling. Um, why was she there? Uh, was she doing an anthropological cultural study of these people? Um, she considered herself a stranger. She wanted to get in with them to go to the squaw dance. Was it another observation she wanted to make of their culture? I, I, enjoyed the comparisons. I thought they were great. Um, but I felt like she was hitting me over. I did not think this was a subtle story. I thought that she was hitting us over the head with, if we could only understand each other, wouldn't the world be a you know unified place? So I'm not a good one to uh, ooh and ah over the story. I, I, I thought it was contrived in a bit. So uh, that was my that was my observation. All right, Elaine. Um, first, of all, girl. first of all, you have to remember that she was a young girl, maybe on spring break, and they make decisions. Kids go everywhere. And when she got there, she maybe wanted more than she had bought into. And, you know, I, it wasn't my favorite story, but I think once she was there, she tried to make the best of it. She tried to have comparisons to things that she knew. And I think the Indian culture is very standoffish from what I know. When we went to Arizona, we had a hard time getting into onto the tribal grounds and things like that. So you have to take it with a grain of salt. It was not my favorite, uh -huh. but I think sometimes people say, oh, I'm gonna go so-and-so. I mean, my kids, my grandchildren have been all around the world. And when they're there, they adapt to whatever's going on in that country. It's and then right. they forget it, they're kids. Um. <laughs> Okay, um, Meryl and then else. I think she wanted a sense of belonging. She says in the first paragraph that she, she wanted a sense of belonging to something <coughs> there. And, uh, when I was reading this story, I had this, this complete deja vu about being on a trip to Santa Fe, New Mexico, and I made this terrible faux pas. I was buying jewelry in a market and it was beautiful jewelry. And I, I was talking to the artist and I said to her, 
and what reservation do you live on? <laughs> and she'd say, what is your tribal affiliation? But I just, it, the words came out wrong. And she said, oh, I don't live on a reservation. And, and then she told me she was Navajo. So I, it just, the whole thing though, you, you want to get to know a culture better, but sometimes things just don't come out right. And what she dealt with here was very light and fluffy compared to say Louise Erdrich, who wrote The Roundhouse in 2012. Yes. I couldn't remember her name. Wow. Yes, yes. Terrible, terrible injustice is going on. And the other thing that made me think of was I go to a Spanish group and recently a woman from whose family was originally from India, she was born in the United States, joined the Spanish group and everybody's asking her about the customs of India. And every holiday she describes, I swear, we could match up with a Jewish holiday. They have something like Sukkot and they have something like Rosh Hashanah and they have something like Shavuot and, 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 and Tu Bishvat. I mean, it was incredible. So I think one of the things she was trying to let us know is that with this Native American culture, we have more in common than we realize. And maybe we just have more in common with all the cultures than, than the differences we keep focusing on. So I, I got something positive out of it. Yeah. I, I agree with that. I'm Alice and then Joyce, then Lynn White. Well, this goes along kind of with what Elaine and what Merle just said. I kind of, fe I felt like visiting um, a Navajo area, is that different than all of our trips that we take all over the world, learning about different cultures? I mean, it is a different culture and I don't see anything wrong with, with doing that. And in fact, I mean, I, I have a friend, I don't remember her story exactly, but I know, I think when she was either in high school or college, she like spent a summer on a Indian reservation doing some kind of, you know, social kind of work. I, you know, I think that that wasn't uncommon, especially, you know, this takes place in the sixties. I think that was a thing that, that people did, you know, reached out to the Indian culture in various ways. Um, I think that was probably not, not an uncommon thing to do. Okay, yeah. um, Joyce, Lynn Whites, and then Andy. I picked up on something. I don't know whether it was just me or anybody else got this. I got the feeling that the um, pro protagonist in the story came from an Orthodox background in Brooklyn and left that background. And was, you know, maybe I'm extrapolating, maybe I'm making up my own story. I'm not sure, but I got it from somewhere and was on her own exploring, got out west. And I, she was in school, but was broke and found this job, was able to find this job. Um, near a, a Navajo reservation at a restaurant and became enamored and um, curious about the culture while she had this summer job and wanted to know more and then impart some of her culture with theirs while she was learning. Did anybody else pick up on this or well, get I, their I actually think when she was um, imparting her culture, she wanted to say, I'm not an Anglo. And that's when she sang the Shema, the Shema. and Kul Nidre. Um, and let, well, let's come back to that. Um, Lynn um, okay. Whites, you need to unmute. Oh, she's showing us something. Wait, you, you need to unmute. Okay. There we go. I don't know if you can see this. Wait, I don't know if you can see this. Picture. A little bit. That's, that's the march. Okay. My that's first march. day as an antique dealer, this picture, this photograph of the Navajo Indians fell out of an old painting from the back of an old painting. It's an Edward Curtis. I don't know if you know who Edward Curtis yes. is. Yes, yes. Okay, he photographed the American Indians 
And this photo is from 1903 and it's called Vanishing Race, Navajo Indians. So I wow. just wanted to show you that. And I even went to the antique road show. It's valued at about five, six thousand dollars. But wow. I was just lucky that it fell. I don't know if you can see it at all. It's we can see it a little in. bit. It looks like they're a riding, beautiful painting. They're, it's a photograph. They're riding. Oh, on, it's a beautiful photograph. They're riding on horseback, vanishing yeah. race. But I do want to say I agree with Lynn Salad that it wasn't one of my favorite. And I almost got a set. This is just my own thing. Sometimes Jewish people, to me, take more interest and pride in somebody else's culture. Mm -hmm. In other words, they go someplace, Thailand, whatever. And somehow I got that feeling just a little bit. You know what I mean? That, I, I don't know. That's just a personal, a sum. But anyways, I wanted to show you the photo. Thank you. We like that. <clears throat> Andy, go ahead. And then Lynn Salad. I, I just think a lot of the conversation has to do with our interest in another culture, the fact that we've traveled or we've done these things and people did these things. I think that now, I mean, having actually experienced this, that if, if you were to go on a service trip, you'd have a lot of training that would be anti the way we're talking about it. That we're not going to help someone else because we can do that. You're, you're gonna respect their ability to make their own decision. It's just this lens that needs to be kind of refocused. And, um, you know, I didn't necessarily have, I don't, I mean, I said that about her. I think that's how it started out. I thought it was interesting that she compared the cultures. Um, I, we, it shouldn't surprise anyone. We, these cultures developed at the same time in the same parts of the country. We have lots of things that cross over because we were, that's where they all started. And um, so, I don't know. That, that's just a, a side, but um, I just think we have to really refocus our lens about this and what, what we're doing, why we're doing it, and, you know, be And how we look at it. Yeah, Rochelle, go ahead. And then well, I, I did not love the story. Um, I, I agree with her comparisons. We don't know anything about this person. We, all we know is that she happened to be there for a period of time and was going back to school. Why couldn't she just be curious and wanna find out about it? I don't think we have to look so deeply into it to see what her ulterior motives were, good or bad. I think she was curious as we all are when we travel. And um, I just, I just, think we, we know nothing about her really. So whatever she was, she wanted to find out. And I don't think that it's a, a judgment that is necessarily something that is bad for her. And I think it's good. I mean, why not find out about it? And why not be curious? And she's young and she wanted to participate. And she also wanted the friendship. Um, Judith and then Lynn Salad. Uh, I I have to give an aside. I am babysitting my 10 year old twin grandsons and one, I keep walking away and I apologize, but I keep, one of them is learning about the Navajo. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a whole chapter and I'm so thrilled. It, it's just odd that this would happen at the same time. But the question was, you know, why did they, he was talking about the amount of land that they used to own and where they used to, they used to um, be nomadic from this state to this state. And then he looked at, at the amount of land that they're now able to live on. And he looked at me like, how can this be? And, it, and so parts of this story helped me to be, I, I will have when I get off of this, uh, it, it helped explain to him that while culturally they don't have the same span, um, we do have respect for them and for their culture. Um, and I, I think the story sort of helps in that regard. Um, Lynn. Okay, so Joyce, I love your story. Maybe you should write this story and give some back backstory to this girl who we know nothing about. I agree with Rochelle. I mean, I love the idea if she's, she's I, I, now I wanna expand on that story and say, She's really questioning her Jew her Judaism, and she's come out to uh, this Navajo area 
and she gets this job because she's broke. I love that element that you, you added. Um, I feel that she's lonely, uh, very lonely, and she's trying to make connection with these people every which way. And um, she's looking for the universal. How can I, you know, we all, when we meet people, what, you know, there's the Jewish geography and all that. She can't do that here. So she's, though, she does use the Jewish, her Jewish roots in a sense to make connection with these people. And I think it's a, um, I think the person who said a sense of belonging, Andy, I think you used that, uh, that term. Um, I think that's what she's looking for, a sense of belonging somewhere and some connection. And, and why does she, it's so important yeah. for her to get to that dance. You know, why does she want to get to that squad dance? It's part of this squad. community and this sense of belonging. So, um, yeah, if we extrapolate and bring our, our experiences to the story, it enhances the story. But I think the story on its own is somewhat superficial that's uh, Merle. My... at Merle um, and then Julie okay um recently um I read a book called writers and lovers mm. and uh it, this it's about a writer who works in a restaurant and in I read it too Massachusetts. I read it too yeah and Lily it King. got a Lily. lot of accolades did you like it yes yes I did and what reminded me of, of her novels. This story is also set in a restaurant, all the frustrations of being a waitress, all the hard work. And you don't know who, you don't know who your waitress is. She might be an aspiring writer, but this girl uses that opportunity to learn about this other culture. And I think that's part of what this story is about too, that there are many opportunities to learn about other people and get, get a sense of belonging. And you have to take these opportunities where and when they come. And I think she has done that. So all of this detail about how frustrating it is in the restaurant is important as, as a backdrop for her story. You could be absolutely right. Julie and then Elaine and then Abby. And then Andy, we gotta write this. Down. I just wanted to comment. Um, did my picture go away? No, you're on. You're okay. Uh, I, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. I just wanted to comment. I googled Fort Defiance, and uh, it's up in northwest, northeast Arizona near Canyon de Chelly, and it was um, uh, built around the middle of the 1800s, and it was really to help. Uh, keep the Indians in check and have some control there. And after it was built, things became very hard for the, the Navajo in that area. And they weren't allowed to use the grazing land outside the fort. And that the, so the building of the fort was um, the beginning of the, the stresses um, of just being able to have day-to-day -day living of the Indians in that area. And um, so there's, if you're interested, there's, you know, there's more to the story of Fort Defiance, but she mentions Fort Defiance over and over and over. And you know, it was near Canyon de Chelly where there was a terrible massacre of the Indians. I, um, and in, in one respect, you can, I mean, if not comparing it to the Holocaust, but it's another example where um, like massacres and the, the Indians at a, one or two times attacked the fort, and of course they were they, their deaths were much larger than the, the, the trouble they caused. They might have been a few soldiers that died, but a lot of Indians. Um, so that's just another aspect of the story that the Indian culture at that at the, the current time. Is, I'm sure is still, um, what's the word I want? Um, it's a, this is, this is terrible, the word accessibility, but it's, um, they're still influenced, they're still troubled by what happened in the 1850s when their grazing land was taken and when they had to start defending themselves in a way they hadn't before. And then there was, they were marched 300 miles to someplace in New Mexico 
which they still remember. Like the picture that Lynn had. I mean, I, I, you know, they're, um, you you know, what happened to them is still with them today. That's And I just want to make one other comment that Bob and I love going to third world countries and have been to a lot. And it's always a high point when accidentally you find some kind of ceremony, celebration, something. And um, I think just tourists, and I, I guess, I'm guessing with her, she's up in an area that's, there's not much there. And um, she, I think she was just very curious or whatever motivated her, but it wasn't like there's, she's, she was not going someplace where she's going to be seeing anything other than wonderful scenery. And it's not like there's cities or something. And um, I think that she just had a lot with, was just very curious and was about to be going back to back home. So I, I just see her as somebody who just was look, looking for interesting, ex, ex, wanted to learn a culture, interesting experiences, and then having the opportunity to be in that restaurant and get to know some of these women over a period of a week gave her the opportunity to get into um, get into it a little deeper with the actual people and, and which prompted her to see those connections and yeah. help. Absolutely. <laughs> um, Elaine. Okay, I think we're putting too much emphasis on this story. I think like Andy said, in the 60s, people maybe went to reservations and thought that they were gonna help the poor little, little uneducated Indian. And this woman got there and she got a job. She wanted to be maybe friends with these other people who were working there, which is what we all do when we had a job. We wanted to be friends with the people, wanted to go out with them at night. It, it's as simple as all that. And it, I don't really think it has inner meaning. I think the Indians, for the most part, even the interior secretary, you know, thank God she's above it, but there's still problems on the uh, reservations and where the Indians live. The alcoholism is very high. They're very alone. Their education level is very alone. And I think it's just a story. It doesn't really have, everyone doesn't have holier than thou interests. Sometimes we do things and they turn out wonderful. It's just an experience. That's all I'm saying. And yeah. I thought the okay. story was all right. just um, a story. Yeah, Evie, Andy, Merle, Van Lynn. Evie. Yeah. I agree that we're reading too much into it. I mean, I love the idea that we're able to extrapolate and learn more about the Indian culture, which I think is very important. But I think she was a teenager. She she actually had the opportunity to have this experience. Granted, she was working, but you have to have a certain comfort level to go out and do this, leave your your more sheltered environment and do that. And it did remind me of, of the opportunity that I had around that age. Whereas one summer I was with some distant relatives and they had family members that were Orthodox. So I came home wanting to emulate that. The following year, I was with a different family that was Southern Reform. And that was my introduction really to Reform Judaism, which I wanted to show off and not show off, but talk about. And it just made me seem different and a little bit more worldly, I thought at the time. So I think this is just kind of her, her growing experience. And I, and I loved that part of it. And the fact that she brought in parts of her culture and so and looking for the similarities and the friendship and so forth. All right, I agree. Um, Merle and then Lynn Salad. I, I thought it was fascinating how she just really started um, looking for references to the Bible and comparing the culture she got down, Abraham and Isaac and the wandering in the desert and even the flood, I mean, the rain, that terrible rain they had, that rainstorm. And um, I just thought she actually, be her, she had a more heightened awareness of her own religion because she was the only one of her religion there. She was the outsider. And I think what 
that she walked away not just learning about the Indians, but just about um, a more heightened awareness of her own religion. Agreed. All right, Andy, I'm so sorry. Then okay, Lynn Sell. Okay. We did not comment on the, um, the dancing they did. So they actually did dance. I think it was one of the most unifying, heartfelt experiences that they all had that drew them together. And it just pointed out the, you know, that's how people connect and how they did without any pretense, they could just move their bodies and step and step in different ways and be drawn together. And I thought that was a very lovely, authentic kind of thing that um, is true. And we, we hadn't mentioned that. So yeah, I, I love that. Yeah. Lynn Salat. I'm going to give a, um, a, a little side thing here. I was working with a student on his um, essay, college essay. And um, he had spent the summer on a reservation and he was trying to impress Stanford uh, about um, how, you know, uh, what a fabulous experience this was. And he, so he's writing in his essay and he said, and what I learned was they had such a hard life. It must've been really tough for them. And I'm so glad that I'm able to live in a, in a, in a, um, uh, uh, in a place where I have all my advantages and I felt very sorry for them. And I said, I don't think this is what you really want to communicate to Stanford University, that you feel sorry for these people because they live in such horrible conditions. And I'm thinking as you're all talking that she did learn. She did learn. She tried to connect with them. Um, I think uh, her, the lessons she'll take back with her um, are, are um, very instructive for her and her life. Um, and so that's what I, I got out of the story. I mean, it, it was a valuable experience for her and she did attempt, and I agree with Andy, I think she learned, and Merle, I think she learned more about her own Judaism than she did about the Navajos. Um, I think maybe that's what she came back with a refreshed um, appreciation of her of her religion and what it meant to her and seeing how their their customs and rituals and traditions were meaningful to them. So in that sense, I guess the story achieved its purpose. Um, I also think back to that scene in the restaurant when um, it was after the rains and they were, things calmed down and the cooks made them something and they let her taste it without warning and how hot and spicy it was. And, um, oh, right. I, I have, um, my kids have really gotten this spicy taste. And I said, you know, do you think by, you know, if you give a kid when they're really little, that spicy, then they're used to it. So we've had that whole discussion in our family. And um, it, it was just fascinating how they all kind of, um, you know, at least she was game. They were kind of making fun of her um, through the whole thing. And the other thing as a Jewish educator that she knew, and of course it was a story, that she knew all the verses of Had God Yah. Do you know all the verses? Yeah. I don't know yeah. all the verses. I and don't know he, Midre. How would she know all that too? Right. And oh, and right in Queen Midre. Yeah, that yeah. was it. I was, like, I was like, oh, good job. Right. But um, and it, it I do say, you know, when I used to talk to parents and they're like, you know, I didn't like religious school, I said, don't say that. I said, first of all, you know, be a good example for your kids. I said, and they go, well, I don't remember. I said, it's like riding a bicycle. It all comes back to you, <laughs> you know, and all of a sudden you're flooded with these memories. And maybe those are the, you know, Seder is one of those memories we hold tight. Ellen Gusson, did you want to say something? You're, yeah, you're muted. muted. Yeah. Um, I think I, I, there's an evolution through this story, her own evolution. We all bring to any experience in traveling what our own backgrounds were, which is what she's done. It, just as you said, in terms of remembering the stuff, but somebody was talking about loneliness and I knew there was a reference in the story. So if you go to page 188, the next to the last paragraph, it's almost the third or fourth last paragraph in the story. It's in the American city of my birth. This is where Joyce um, was talking about, I think. I was a stranger too. I learned the city's ways until I passed, assimilated. 
but for the strange intonations of my prayers out of the ghetto. I never regretted the passage. Beyond the ghetto, there are a thousand worlds to see, thus her adventure. I was often lonely for the security of the separated, but loneliness is a small price to pay, and the pain of it would have had as much easing as I could give it. This night was such an easing, she finally had accomplished her goal and been part of the group. I didn't know the Navajo, not their language or beliefs. They didn't know Abraham or Isaac, but I wasn't lo lonely, stumbling over what they knew and expected. Why should I be? It was the biggest ghetto I had ever seen. I think there's a lot of substance in that in that paragraph. Yeah, I I totally completely agree. You know, and um, Andy, go ahead. Well, I think that was just taking what what Lynn said. We we could take that one step further, talking about the person who wrote the essay. What you hope she learned was how people are all the same and that underneath there are different cultures. So you learn how to relate to people and that they're not different or the other, but they have a common humanity. And that's the, the final, I hope she did learn that. I mean, I think, you know, in dancing or in singing, you learn those things. Yeah. I mean, at the very end, it says, um, the tenements of the old ghetto team with people, shriek, noise, and stench. Um, wash lines scar the sky between the houses. The streets shine with rotting fish skins. A man lives his swarming impact of life without seeing one green thing growing from the ground. With such similarities, how could I miss? Yeah. And I, you know, that brings it back to New York. Right. Right. So. Yeah. Which is what. How you yeah. Yes. Um, Twice is that word. Yeah, Lynn, go ahead. Maurice, is that where you got the idea of um, maybe that she was from an Orthodox background because mm -hmm. she was in Brooklyn and yeah. she read maybe that was the scene for your story. Joyce, if you want to reply, just unmute. Um, Judy Biederman, and you need to unmute. Oh, you, no, you, you did the opposite, Judy. <laughs> you took your picture off. You, you need to unmute. Okay. There you go. Now, there you go. For those of you who have read or are reading cast, it, wonderful and as hopeful and everything as this story is, and of course, it's 50 years earlier, still not a lot has changed. And so it's a story with some degree of hope, but I'm afraid it's not really real. At the individual level, maybe, but Cast is teaching us another reality that I think is, is close to the truth. So that might be a story a book that we might want to look at. Um, agreed. I, I, I do want to look at that. Evie, what were you going to say? Yeah, one comment that I had forgotten to make was what struck me in the uh, the scene in the in the restaurant was when um, I guess her friend or another waitress said, we know what you do not eat. Yes. And it reminded me of uh, Ron Miller from A Covered Ground, May He Rest in Peace. Um, gave the example of um, a conversation he had with, a, a, I guess it must have been three people, and, the, and one person said, what do you do as a Jew? Like, not what do you not do, but what do you do? And this kind of struck me because it reminded me of a movie we saw maybe within the last year, and I think it was a Western kind of a setting where um, the waitress said, what do you not want to eat? You know, because their menu was the same all the time. Like, what items you want to eliminate. So this this particular sentence is, I know what you do not eat, re really struck me. Yeah. Um, Judy a, Biederman and then Andy. There's another short scene in the restaurant that's amusing, but true. The old lady is trying to order and she's getting angrier and angrier and she wants the Native American waitress and no one else. And it reminded me of all these people who only want a Jewish doctor. 
<laughs> but I, I think that was. <laughs> yeah. And that's a very strong woman or a. Yeah, there's some truth to that. Um, Andy. Well, I just wanted to, Evie brought up the, the question about with Ron Miller. And I heard him say in a class that um, he was in the car with Abraham Joshua Heschel coming that's back right. from the airport. Yeah. And he said, what? So he asked someone, so what did you do today that makes you Jewish? Oh. Yeah. Well, it might've been the same thing. It just, was special, yeah. Yeah. Fascinating. Yeah. Okay, Lynn um, White, you had your hand up and then Julie and Julie, you're gonna have to unmute. Just when, um, who said about the Jewish doctor? I forgot. <laughs> just, yeah, yeah. My uh, cousin was a eye doctor on an Indian reservation. He lived in Arizona. So that connection came up. And then, <laughs> I also feel so, um, you know, the, the Indians have become, you know, with COVID-19, they keep talking about how it's hit the Indian reservation so bad. So I, I, I'm not sure exactly why, is it because they all live together so closely, but I thought maybe someone wanted to comment on that. Um, well, so the one comment I would say is that instead of Indian, we should be saying Native American. Instead of reservation, we should be saying Native lands. So that's one. Um, in you know, I'm on a lot. I'm on a lot of Zooms, and now uh, there's a trend of people when it's mainly young people. Like you see, I have my pronouns there, but sometimes they also put which indigenous lands they're from. Because, you know, if you think about it in Illinois, Algonquin, I mean, all of the, you know, all there's a lot of Native American names and, um, you know, who were here before. And it would be interesting. I'm, obviously, there's a map that I could go look at and see, which I should have before this. So, um, and, and I think that I, I don't know why, but people of color um, in general have, uh, you know, been really have been hit harder in this pandemic. I don't know if it's their living conditions. I don't know if it's their health care. I, I have no idea. Um, and I, I can tell you, you know, that in Israel, um, it's hitting the ultra orthodox because they're not listening to what you have to do. But that's a kind of a, a separate thing. You know, are the Native Americans listening? I, I, I don't know. Um, and I don't know enough about that, you know, that culture and uh, and what's happening. And I and I the other thing, you know, I the one thing that Native Americans have done, um, especially with their tribal lands, is there's a lot of casinos and there's some uh, very good business people, and they've made money so that Native Americans can have better schools and they can address alcoholism and. And, and the different things that are going through uh, with their people. Um, Julie Schlossberg, um, and then maybe Marsha, but Julie Schlossberg, and you have to unmute your phone or whatever you were. No. <laughs> Julie, you're on two things. Uh, here, ask to unmute, there we go. There you go, we can hear, no? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Yes. This, I've got a echo on my end. Yeah. I don't know what happened. Um, if you can hear me, okay. Um, I was just going to comment that it was interesting that she um, was chose to have the Indian culture. Um, the the girl could have gone been someplace else for her quote gap year or whatever she was doing. Um, she could have been in Central America. She could have been in a lot of places where she would confront another culture and have, perhaps have similar experiences, but to find this right here in our own backyard within our own country with a, with a, um, with a group of people that who we've probably always had misunderstandings about and, and have caused great suffering to um, in our own right here at home, I think um, is not insignificant. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, Marcia Rosenbaum, did you want to say something? Yeah, just briefly. Um, you know, um, in Arizona, there's like a large tracts of land that's Navajo Nation, and they do not have access to health care in many cases. They don't have access even to running water. And so um, 
they've really had a hard time. And also it's lots of communal living and there's a lot of poverty. So that's a reason why they've been, they've been hit so hard by the pandemic. But fortunately there are some really good Samaritan groups that have come in there. Like it's called Team Rubicon and that's a whole group of volunteers that go in there and Doctors Without Borders have come in there too for testing and for, you know and and to educate them on, as to how to deal with deal with this and you know and to and ha to, to try to do like social distancing and and mask wearing and so forth and then the other thing that they did which like the republicans didn't like was they started to not let um they started restricting tourists and people coming into the area because they felt a lot of that was transmitting worse and so they got some pushback on that but I think they were able to hold fast and and do it but you know it's really it, it, it's kind of a tragedy that they've been like a forgotten people with education and health care yeah yeah um Lynn and then Andy but Alice said to us um she's gotten more than one communication from cultural institutions in Chicago explaining what tribal lands they occupy now so it's definitely coming into all right Lynn Salah and then Andy you know, as Marsha's talking, I'm, I'm thinking about the story and we don't get into that. We just get subtle references to that past and the slaughter and the tragedy and the ghettos. And I think this was an attempt to maybe move forward uh, into, as you said, everyone said, of commonality of, of of culture, um, that's what we have to hold on to is our culture and our traditions and uh, the similarities. So I think these references to the Holocaust or the, the slaughter of the Indians, not in this story. Um, so that in a sense, I think has a more optimistic um, tone to it than if, if we had gone into the tragedies here. I don't know, maybe people feel that that should have been in there, but I, I, I think that it was deliberate not to not to put those in. Yeah, I, 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 I agree with you. Andy? Yeah, I think I, I agree with that too, but I'm kind of struck with, um, I've traveled out there to the Southwest that we've driven. And I mean, every time I do this, I, I'm just heartbroken at what I see, where these people are living and allocated and what we've done. And I don't hear that outrage. Um, it, and it's sort of like, I mean, you know, uh, Isabel Wilkerson's book before the cast was The Warmth of Other Sons about the migration and about what was done to people here. And, and we're still, we're still doing it. I, I got some seeds from the botanic garden. This is really an aside, but I'll say it fast. And I, I, we planted the beans and we were supposed to take them back. And I didn't know if they were beans that you had to sprout after we got them. And I finally got back to the botanic garden and they looked them up and guess what they were? Cherokee Trail of Tears beans. Because wow. they had these beans that they could actually eat, but they were one of the few that you could actually keep and sprout. And you just oh my yeah and I just, and they were right here I mean we we grew them ourselves and you know took some back and I don't they didn't do that this year well, obviously yeah. anyway it, it just you know that's a, some words that are very yeah. uh, really drawn. Um, and I I think you're both right I mean the thing that um, that kind of hit me is that she describes herself as a stranger in New York. And, um, you know, whether the Native Americans are strangers there, and it's something for us um, to think about. And uh, when we, whatever we see on the news or try to bring it into the news or um, bring it into our awareness. So uh, I, I just thought it was, um, I, I liked it because so, so much of what I read, you know, whether it be Holocaust or European, you know, this was really American <laughs> and um, it was just a fascinating story. We meet again next week and I just wanna tell everyone that somebody emailed me and said she saw we were doing this story next week. Could she join? <laughs> She's from Connecticut. 
that she leads other book groups. Now, if you were my students, I'd say, listen, be on good behavior, but you are all always on good behavior. I don't have to say that. Um, and uh, I'm really gonna have to um, prepare, but we, you know, let's read the story. Let's have some good questions. Not that you don't, but I, all of a sudden, I was the, and then I said, sure, you can come. I was like, how did you find out about this? And she's, uh, anyway. Um, so you'll, you know, hopefully she'll be here. I, you know, send her the link. I will be better about sending out the link again. And um, it's just great seeing everyone. And any questions, you know where to find me. And uh, we're, we're, we're plowing through this book. <laughs> Alice, that's <laughs> that's right. Joy. I'm not going to be nervous. <laughs> Listen, the one thing I don't have to worry about is that you all, you all talk. So I don't <laughs> never have to worry about that. Is it the next story in the book? Is that what we're reading? It makes no difference. Um, the next story no, is the next one. <laughs> Sour Suntan. Yes, Sour or Suntan. It makes no difference okay. by <clears throat> drinking the cat. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks, Vanessa. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. 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 Bye.